Hi there. Thank you, everyone, for joining us here tonight. We're so happy that you can spend your evening here with us. My name is Jessica Talford, and I'm the marketing coordinator for Friends of Royal Alberta Museum Society, or FRAMS for Stores. We're very pleased to be co-presenting with the Royal Alberta Museum this kitchen table talk with Elaine Alexi and Jamie Campbell. FRAMS is a registered charity and not-for-profit membership organization that promotes and supports the museum in a variety of ways. Now that the museum has reopened as of today, now is a great time to become a FRAMS member and gain access to a year of exciting events, discounts, and unlimited admission to the museum. We'd love for you to join our community in support of the museum and programs for all Albertans. To learn more about FRAMS, to become a member or to donate in support of free events such as this one, please visit frams.ca. Before we kick things off tonight, I have a few housekeeping items to mention. Along the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat button. Please feel free to use the chat window to make comments or have discussions. Also, you can reach out to FRAM supports in the chat window if you have any tech issues. Closed captioning is available. There's an option to activate or deactivate it along the bottom menu bar. Just to let you know, we're recording tonight's session and in the next few days, the link to view the recording will be available on the RAM and FRAMS website. At the end of the talk, you'll see a short five question survey in your web browser. We would appreciate it if you could take a few moments to provide us with your feedback. And that's it for housekeeping items. I'm going to pass things over now to Emma, Assistant Curator of Indigenous Studies at the RAM. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. And thank you to everybody for making the time to come to this presentation today. And thank you to the FRAMS for support. Um, as, we, as she said, my name is Emma. I'm the Assistant Curator of Indigenous Studies here at RAM. I'm a settler and first generation immigrant, and it's my privilege to live, work, and play here in Amiskwichi, Wiskahigan, which is the traditional territories of the Nahiawak, Nakota Sioux, and a homeland to the Metis. Edmonton has long been a gathering place for generations of Nitsitapi, Stoney, Sutina, Soto, Dene, Inuit, and many other Indigenous people. I give thanks to all of the elders and knowledge keepers I have the honor of working with here at the museum, and I commit to making space for Indigenous voices, knowledges, and presence within the museum, so that Indigenous histories and relationships of this land can be shared by those who know them best. <clears throat> um, so before we begin, I'd just like to take this time to acknowledge the recent news of the remains of 215 Indigenous children found in a mass grave on the site of the Kamloops Indian Residential School. 104 more were found last week at the Brandon Indian Residential School. And there's developing news stories coming from multiple sites in Saskatchewan. This news is and continues to be heartbreaking. But let's not forget that residential school survivors have been telling these truths for decades. In fact, volume four of the TRC report is a 266 page document that deals specifically with missing children and unmarked burials. This remains an important call to action and I hope you will join me in committing to learning more about the ongoing impact of residential schools, calling on our governments to fulfill the TRC's 94 recommendations and to donate if you can to indigenous run organizations working with survivors and their families. Now I'd like to ask you to please join me in a moment of silence to honor the lives of these children. Thank you. So it is my pleasure today to introduce our two speakers, Jamie Campbell and Elaine Alexi. Jamie is um, the name behind White Otter Design. She's Anishinaabe from Curve Lake First Nation in Ontario, currently residing in BC. 
I've been really fortunate to follow Jamie's journey over the last couple of years and to witness her explosion into the Indigenous jewelry and fashion design world. Elena Lexi is a member of the Tiflitgwitchin First Nation living here in Edmonton. I first met Elaine in 2018 when she came to the museum to visit with Gwitchin and Dene belongings. Little did I know that we'd be working together in the future. Elaine is now the curator of Indigenous Studies here at RAM, and I feel very privileged to work alongside her. Elaine and Jamie are both featured artists in a new case in RAM's Human History Gallery called In Their Footsteps, which I'll talk about a little bit later in this event. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Elaine and Jamie. Thank you. Masitro Emma, thank you very much. Drinsakwinzi Shalakat, Chukdrinsha Otli, Elena Laxi Virji, Patleche Sat in Gwatsadichu. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Elena Lexi. I am from Fort McPherson, Northwest Territories, and a member of the Tetlik Wichita First Nation. I am very happy to be here with you all this evening. I am the curator of Indigenous Studies uh, at the Royal Alberta Museum. Aside from this work, I am also a practicing artist and researcher. So I would like to welcome everyone to this uh, virtual online event this evening which is one of, the, one of several to celebrate Indigenous History Month here at the Royal Alberta Museum. This particular event uh, marks the beginning of our ongoing work in creating learning opportunities and providing space for Indigenous artists and community members to share their stories, voices, and art with our community. I thank you for joining us today. I am very excited to welcome our special guest, Jamie Campbell, to this virtual space. I am a huge fan of her work and have been following her for several years. And I guess to begin, I ask you, Jamie, you know, tell us about yourself and where are you from? Sure. Um, uh, Anin, Nadizhna Kaz, Monkwe, Jamie Campbell, Nadizhna Kaz. Uh, Mississauga, Anishinaabe, Kwe, Nada, uh, Nindudam, Makwa, uh, Curve Lake First Nation, Nadunjaba, uh, New Denver, BC, or unceded Sinaiqs territory, uh, Nin Shigudaya. So uh, my name is Jamie Campbell, and um, I am from the Bear Clan. I am Mississauga Ojibwe from, uh, well, currently known as Ontario um, in Curve Lake, but I currently live uh, on unceded Sinaiqs territory in British Columbia. And I am the artist behind White Otter. So I, um, I'm an artist and an auntie and a wife and a daughter and um, a dog mom and uh, a writer. And yeah, so, but this is what I do full time. Amazing. You're, for folks who don't know, like, uh, I mean, you've been everywhere. You've been to the North. That's how I first caught your work at a daycare in the Yukon. You know, you've done amazing collaborative work with other Indigenous artists, and you know, you participated in national events like uh, Fashion Week, Indigenous Fashion Week. So it's such a huge honor to have you with us, and thank you for taking the time to participate in this. Um, I think to begin, um, you know, uh, as we come into this event, you know, I want to also create space for, for us both to talk about, you know and give recognition to what was unfolding nationwide um, in Canada the past two weeks. You know, um, I think to, we can't really get into a discussion without really letting folks know how it's affecting us as Indigenous artists. Um, you know, um, I just think, you know, it's a really good starting place for us to just possibly share what it's been like for us the past two weeks. You know, it's been really heavy. Um, is there anything that you would like to share about, you know, what uh, um, what has happened and what has been, you know, uh, for me, it has affected me and my community. <laughs> um, it's been very heavy. Um, so is there anything you would like to share? Because I think, you know, in planning this event, we talked about, you know, we felt we needed to do something to, to shed light on that. So if there's anything you'd like to share on that. Yeah, I think, you know, for, for all of us, like we're, you know, we're artists, but 
but what happens in our communities and when news like this breaks, like it's not separate for us, you know, like my art is very much a part of my, who I am and my identity and my spirituality. And when something like this happens, that is so, you know, we all know the stories and we all grow up with the stories, but when, when, you know, these, these children are found and these stories come out, I think it just, it, it impacts every facet of our lives, you know, and we, we may share our, our art online or, or we continue to do art in our homes. But, you know, I know for me, like it's, it's greatly impacted my family, you know, and, and it's part of our discussions every day. And it's part of, you know, how we, how we interact with our community around us and how we interact with our families in our homes and, um, yeah, it's, it's been a really, really heavy few weeks. And I, I would say, you know, the one thing I'm really grateful for is that, um, you know, I think so many of us have been there for each other through all of this and sort of having those spaces where, where we can, we can talk to each other, we can support one another. And, you know, I think for me, like my heart just goes out to Kamloops and to all the communities where this information is coming from. And, you know, um, my dad's a 60 scoop survivor. Both my grandmothers were Indian day school survivors. So it's, it, it, all of it hits home. I think no matter it, it hits all of us. Mm -hmm. So I just, um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think with, uh, you know, it's, it's really hard to not feel impacted at all. And, and for me, um, it's been exactly like that too. Uh, the past two weeks has been extremely heavy thinking about, you know, a pouring of supports. Um, what I found so really amazing about the online Indigenous social community is that there was just so much efforts of people, you know, sharing, story sharing, sharing of information, um, you know, people doing fundraising, you know, that has been just so amazing. And I find that so uplifting with Indigenous communities. Um, and particularly the artist communities, they're able to do that and they have done that and they're coming through for that. So I really appreciate that. And yeah, yeah my, my heart goes out to, to all the communities and what's yet to come um, as they continue to search for more, um, to add more locations. So um, I find that um, creating, uh, for me, as I mentioned that, you know, past two weeks has been difficult. Uh, creating for me brings enjoyment and it brings me peace and you know it's it's hard to kind of go to that place when something like this you know hits us and I think this really demonstrates wider to to people understanding that you know um, it's 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 really interconnected you know our practice our connection with community with family um, I personally um, was part of the last generation that attended the last school that closed in 96. <laughs> and that was not long ago. Um, and I have firsthand experiences of how what it feels like being away from community, being away from land, from home, from culture. Um, so it's very much a lived experience. Um, so in that, can, making that connection with community, um, can you describe to me, um, you know, Community is a very big part of what we do. Uh, what would you like people to know about your community? And you know, what does what does that look like in terms of your art making? Yeah, that's such a, such a big question for sure. Um, and I think, you know, for me, like I I grew up and lived in my my home community. I was very lucky to 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 be able to do that. And then you know, I, I moved away for a long time and I sort of, you know, I was, you know, 18, 19, and it kind of became less at the forefront of, of my life. And, um, and then when I was in university, I went and I spent some time um, in Little K in the Northwest Territories. And I remember they were working on a park up there. And I was like, this is so cool. Like, I didn't know that this kind of thing was happening. And that, you know, there were people who were working so hard on these like partnerships and consultation and um you know all these things it just like opened this whole new world for me and so when I left university I ended up in a Cree community in northern Alberta um my dad used to be a Aboriginal liaison for Corrections Canada and he was working in um Grand Cache and so I ended up there for 10 years working for the nation mm -hmm. there and it was a real it was like a very um 
interesting time of my life to be there because I, I really connected to that community there. And I really, I learned so much from elders and mentors and um, through that whole sort of process, it was like, you know, you go through all of your own identity things and, and all these things. And I, um, I ended up like, you know, spending a lot more time at home in my own community and, you know, really learning about our family and our history and, um, which is an ongoing journey that never sort of ends for sure. But I think, you know, what really came down to it was I think that all these relationships throughout my life have sort of shaped how I've become an artist. And it's at different it. points in my life that those relationships have been catalysts for like, almost like taking it to the next step or, or stepping into sort of different projects or different expressions of style. And so like, I think, you know, for me, like community has so many different words, like community, like meanings, like community is my home community and like the Anishinaabe people and community is also this beautiful community of artists we have online you know and community is also my my family and so I think that you know for me it's been really embracing that it's it's not always either or it doesn't have to just be one thing it can be mm -hmm. yes and and we have these big beautiful communities that you know I'm so grateful for for you know through this artist process and and becoming an artist and you know I've met friends for life through that that now are a huge part of my community so um yeah that's amazing yeah. you it sounds like you have a big big community of folks like <laughs> hundred cousins you know <laughs> yeah. yeah I was gonna say the same thing <laughs> yeah. so yeah so there you go it's a very big <laughs> yes so, so what sparked the moment for you um you know, in making, in, in, and, you know, in creating, and what was that first project that you've done that, that, that sent you on the journey that you're on now? You know, I was trying to think about one thing, and for whatever reason, this is what came to mind for me, but I was, I was taking a course at the Banff Center when I worked for the nation. It was, it was uh, Indigenous strategic planning, and we had this um, Anishinaabe instructor named Don McIntyre. He was amazing. He's also a painter, and he, um, he was teaching us strategic planning based on drum making. And uh, we were going through this process. We got to the end of our drum making, which was just this amazing, you know, teaching he gave us. And then we were supposed to paint the drums. And he was like, how many of you guys in the room consider yourself an artist? And I was like, Pfft. I was like, I suck at painting. Like, I am not a good artist. I am not like, and there was something inside of me that was like, so upset about that question almost because I felt like, I don't know, I felt like I, I think in my mind, I had these like really Western ideas of what an artist was at that time, like a painter or, you know, like I had to sort of have pursued professionally being an artist or something like that. And I, I was like, I remember it stuck with me for days and days and I, there was just something about it. And then, you know, working in the community, I did, I, I had these opportunities over the years to start to hide tan and spend time you know I was I was doing so much difficult work with with elders around land and consultation and resource development that I was like you know I just want to spend time outside of this having a relationship and and a lot of times I would visit and they'd be beating or horse hair wrapping or whatever and it just sort of I don't know when I picked it up it just felt right and I think all those things kind of came together for me. And I, and it was like, oh, wait a second. Like, this is probably like the truest expression of who I am as a person. And it just sort of stuck, I guess. <laughs> I'm really curious to know who are you wearing this evening? Oh, Beautiful. these are mine actually. Oh. They're yeah, they're new. I haven't shown them yet. So if you're here, you're the first people seeing them. Um, but I have been, my dad brought these really cool history books over from Curve Lake. They're super old and rare. And in the back, there's all these incredible old black and white photos of beadwork. And so I've been sort of studying some of those and looking at like really old bandolier bags and that sort of a thing. And so it sort of spurred 
um, this new beadwork and they are I um they're sort of a rendition of a thistle oh beautiful yeah yeah and then this uh this here this big beautiful ring is uh Tanya Joan June Raphael she is Navajo um but she yeah so that's who I'm wearing beautiful <laughs> what are you wearing <laughs> well I am wearing uh these beautiful earrings are made beaded earrings are made from a family member um I want to shout out to family member Rini Alexi for making these beautiful beaded and uh, she used moose hide as well. Um, so I feel really refreshed sitting here and I could just get whiffs of moose hide, yeah. and, you know, sipping on this tea. And <laughs> so, so that's who I'm wearing today. So. Oh, that's lovely. I know I, I never wear my own work. I don't own anything actually. So I luckily have some stuff right now. And I was like, gonna wear these tonight but <laughs> oh, beautiful and I look forward to seeing more of your new stuff with the new designs and everything so oh thank you <laughs> so on that note um what is your preferred mediums to work with right now um I know that you said that you 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 do many things really like with high tanning beadwork sewing moccasins you know you do a lot of different kinds of um, indigenous art so is you know what is it that you're primarily working on now um and what was that uh you know um that launching moment what what really you, you mentioned it briefly earlier but you know what was it that really got you um in terms of making yeah so for me, like beadwork, I would say is my my favorite medium for sure. But I think I I honestly think it's because I haven't dedicated as much time to other mediums yet. Um, high tanning, I think you know that's a huge part of it because for me it was, you know I've I've been through quite a process with my journey of high tanning and I. I feel like you know when like even ten years ago when I first moved there I had this mindset that was like. I have to learn this and I want to learn it now. And I wanted to just learn everything I possibly could as fast as I possibly could. And I always had so much, not, not like outward resistance, but just it would sort of never work out or never line up and, you know, or, or it would in little pieces. And, and it really taught me a lot about when I sort of let go of that, it taught me a lot about like you receive teachings when you're ready for them. Mm. You know, and, and I think that has become so big for me in my journey as an artist and just accepting that and knowing and, you know, so I, I really, my grannies were quill work artists. Um, that was a big thing in my family. And I work with quills a little bit, but not near the skill that so many people have. And, but I, I think for me, I've gone, you know what, when it's the right time and when it's the right when I'm, you know, ready or in a good place to learn that, I will. And so, um, yeah, like, I think I've just, you know, tried to really, and it's, you know, I, I tend to hide once. It was my first time ever tanning an Al-Qaeda and I was learning from this family who I love so much and, but I had my own family things going on and I was in a rush and I was like, okay, I'm going to do this on Monday and this on Tuesday and this on Wednesday. It's going to be done by Thursday. I was just like raring to go, you know, and it was the hardest. It was so hard. I oh cried God. every night and I, I ended up, I lit it on fire. It like by accident, it wasn't, you know, and I, it was, it like almost broke me, you know, and I was like this, I, maybe I'm not meant to do this, you know, and, and then, you know, it was about a year later, it just sort of came about really naturally. I had a ton of time. I just like, totally gave in I was comfortable in the space I was learning in I was like it was and I, it was the most beautiful moments ever like they're one of some of my favorite times in my life and mm -hmm. so it really taught me like you know that this isn't about like a schedule and like pumping something out or doing that or working to anybody else's schedule it's like you just really have to to take that time and be in that headspace so I think I'm getting way out of your question, I think, but <laughs> <laughs> not at all. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so beadwork and is is big for me in, in art and, and 
Um, I, right now I'm working on a very cool project with my dad uh, where I am stepping outside of my comfort zone a little bit. I'm stepping outside of the jewelry realm. Um, my dad is a painter and so we're actually working together on some pieces with beadwork and quill work and painting um, and a little bit of medicines and it's um, it's it's a totally different um, it's it's the same. I'm doing the, the same things, but we're we're actually doing the project based on some of our ancestors. And so, um, part of the project is that we are recording my dad telling stories. And I think, you know, it's been so cool. Like each one of these pieces is reflective of our our different family members who I actually the majority of them have never never got the opportunity to meet. Um, and so hearing all of these stories and all of these funny stories and all of these things about them has just been, it's just, it, yeah, it's a different level of creating totally and being able to do that with my dad has just been amazing. Wow. That's awesome. It sounds very, very healing. And that's like the power of creating, right? And doing and creating art is like it has that healing it also has those really hard truth moments though too right you're talking about you know you had some hard lessons in high tanning and you know and really for me that's how I've learned too and that's what you know my my biggest teacher in my life is my mom Dorothy and she's really positive she's she really pushes me um, you know, doing things that, and I think it really has agency too, because we're able to control, you know, our comforts and getting out of our comforts. That's the hard teaching moment. And like, there's a few times when I'm high tanning with her and I cut holes in my hide and I feel so awful. <laughs> and she's like, you'll get there, you'll get there. You're learning, you know, you're learning. So so I think that process too, it's, it's so incredibly teaching. Um, it really humbles you. That's how, that's what I feel like it's for me too. It, it really is a humbling process. And um, I, for me, when I bead, you know, I have to be in a really good mindset. I have to feel good. You know, I have to feel good to go there um, and to be there because that's one of the fundamental important teachings that I was taught is like, don't feed or soul when you're angry or you're sad or you're uh because that's what you put into your work you know the energy that you derive from that you know you you pass it on and so you know that goes to say with all types of processing for for making indigenous art you know has those same values um i i love beading i love uh high tanning um i prefer to really do it uh, when I'm at home in my territory, um, when I when I'm able to, um, which I hope this year that I'm able to go home, yeah. um, it's just it's just healing, and I find it really helps me. So for me right now, beading is my medium. Um, sewing, I like to do, I like to just really practice my sewing skills, my freehand skills. Um, I find that most enjoyable, and it's just. Uh, yeah, it takes time and I'm learning to be patient with my time. Obviously I work full time here and I'm also a student. Um, so making this year has really slowed down for me a little bit. Um, I'm not making as much as I'd like to, but I think it's teaching me, you know, um, uh, finding that balance, grounding balance of doing all these multiple things. It's uh, um, I'm still striving. I mean, I'm still here. I'm thriving. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes I'll get sparks of inspiration and I'll just do stuff, you know, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll just act on an impulse. Um, so some of your teachings um, from your home, from culture, um, what are some of the teachings that has really informed you in terms of um, how you approach making and um, I shared a little bit about, you know, being in a good place, being in a, a grounding place, but what are some of the teachings that has helped you grow as an artist? Yeah, I think, you know, some of them, they, some of the big things have been, you know, really honoring and thinking about the life cycle of the materials that we're using. 
you know, and that when we are using hides or we are hide tanning or processing, you know, thinking about that animal and acknowledging that animal and using all the different parts of it, you know, and, and then when we are working with it, you know, I, to me, working with hide is such an honor and it is so, you know, I'm, I'm always so mindful of, of things around like waste and, and things around, you know, like just really, really honoring those materials that I'm working with. And I, I know you too, like work with a lot of vintage beads and just sort of honoring the stories of these beads that are like, you know, decades to a hundred years old, like, and the, and the stories that those beads have gone through to get to us and, and then weaving our own stories into those pieces. And, you know, I think my family and, and our culture, like we have such huge pieces of storytelling. And I think storytelling really grounds a lot of the work that I do. And, and I try really hard, you know, each piece for me, like I don't just sort of make stuff and I'm like, well, I got new stuff. Like I, each sort of new design or new piece, like it comes over a lot of time. Like some of these pieces I've actually had for around eight months because they've just sort of, it's been like, well, what is their name and what are they representing and what stories through my community are they holding and how, you know, and, and so it's, you know, a lot about just slowing down and appreciating, like, even along the last lines that we were talking about, like, you know, I think as, as artists, sometimes we get these outside pressures to create and, and it's, mm -hmm. you know, our, our teachings are that, you don't bead when you're not and especially with something like that in recent news that's come out it's like I don't I really want to take the time to to grieve that and acknowledge that and heal that and not be you know necessarily creating and so some same similar very similar teachings around like you know um just moving slowly and doing things with a lot of intention and you know um letting that guide us as creators I think and and it's hard because you have to unpack that like I feel like I constantly have to unpack that and remind myself and and be okay with that and and sort of create a create I guess a like a, a network around myself that I don't ever put that pressure on myself to be you know just having to ramp up all the time like it's, you know, I think we're really multifaceted individuals, all of us, um, and, and just respecting and making space for that is, is a, I think, a big teaching for me. But um, yeah, I think things like um, humility around like uh, spirit beads and, and things like that, um, you know, I always used to like, I was such a perfectionist. And when I was learning to bead, I, um, I've told this story a lot, but one of the women who was teaching me, um, her name was Helen, and uh, she was like just such a tough, strong woman. And she cut this pattern out for me, and I took it home. And I, oh my gosh, I must have worked on it for two weeks. It was like the size of a moccasin vamp. It wasn't even that big. And I, oh, I just put my heart and soul into this thing, and it was rough. <laughs> and I took it down to show her, and she just kind of looked at it, nodded, and threw it right in the garbage. And I was like oh my gosh and she cut the same pattern for me again and said try again like keep practicing mm -hmm. and you know like um it was like such a huge lesson for me and and you know like a couple of years later you know I was visiting with a, another matriarch elder and she only spoke Cree didn't speak any English and she looked at my beadwork and for the first time in like seven years looked at me and in full English was like one day you'll be a good beater. Oh. <laughs> they're, but, so, but. <laughs> they're so sweet yet, you know, they're very honest and, you know, you're, you got there, you're getting yeah. there, you're challenging yourself. Yeah, those are, uh, <laughs> that's a great story to share. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but just keep practicing and be patient and, and mm -hmm. yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's one of the advice that I give to to folks who I talk to who are starting to learn how to be wanting to get into it and try it for themselves. And, um, you know, the first the first time you try anything, really, you know, you're so new to it. And once you keep practicing and practicing, you know, you get into a different comfort zone. And when I started beating, you know, I started with 10 size 11 beads. And that's kind of like the standard, you know, when everybody starts and then 
now like I'm I feel really comfortable. I love feeding with size 13 bees. Um, for some people, you know, that's too small for them. Um, and then, you know, just, I, I just, I don't know why I just really love, you know, the size and especially like the, the new designs that I'm, I'm creating as well. And like this, the designs that I do is really inspired by old witch and designs that I found through my research, looking at museum collections, looking at old publications and research that have been done. And, and in, in, in my family, we have several pieces um, that's still within the family. And that's where I draw my inspiration from is looking at those old types of designs and just really learning about the history. You mentioned your family history can tell us so much, you know, it could teach you so much. And I find that's the essence of um, you know, what I do um, is keeping these forms alive and uses that could just teach us so much, not just the formation or the arrangement. It's just, um, there's something so alive about doing, of making, you know, we're keeping this tradition alive. And I feel that that bears a huge responsibility, but I mean, it's amazing. I, I love it. And you mentioned vintage beads, like, oh my God, that is a totally different area that, you know, I'm sure you can relate. You know, I've accidentally stumbled through um, this door of learning about bead history because bead history is so fascinating. It's so amazing. And to learn about the different old time style beads our ancestors used, um, it's quite fascinating. And that's, yeah, that's, I think that's another talk on its own. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you get on that vintage deep, uh, wagon, you know, it's hard to get off it because it's, <laughs> you, they're just so beautiful. Totally. I also love size 13. It's probably my favorite now as well. I, but I, I am starting to dabble in like 13s to 15s. So even going, you can get yeah. such a different level of detail um which Absolutely. is so yeah. you know and I, I definitely started with like 10s and 11s and just really practicing my technique with those bigger beads I think was so much easier and then you can kind of start to to work with smaller and smaller and smaller when you can find needles for them but <laughs> <laughs> yeah like I, I and I also like experimenting with different sizes and different pieces so you might do mm -hmm. a few that are like 11s and then your centerpiece is 15s or something because you can mm -hmm. really just show like some depth in pieces with different colors mm -hmm. absolutely yeah I'm, I'm dipping into that micro range as well and it's just so fun to experiment and like drawing on the uh, other Indigenous artists and their amazing work working with micros, like, oh my gosh, like Jamie Okuma. Um, <laughs> I, her work is so mind blowing and it's just so amazing to see that level of detail. And, you know, that's really amazing. So um, I'm in that same boat too, so. <laughs> yeah. And it's cool, I think, like I look too at, at, you can also see, I think some of the, really old beadwork you look at like you can see the influence of what was available at that time and you get like really primary colors and really um you know like whatever I, I think whatever was available in those areas you know and I know like even now like when I was working um up north it would be like oh well we can get these beads from uh, Halfords and so it was like most of the beadwork was like limited to the Halford beadwork colors or whatever it is but it's so cool to see people's individual styles come out through their color choices when they're sort of like not modernizing but but keeping those old patterns alive and like you can you can almost start to see like you're like oh that's so-and-so's work just from their color choices and I think that's so cool yeah absolutely it's uh I think that's for me that's such a challenging part in making is just making that hard choices of which colors to use it's <laughs> just constantly <laughs> looking at the bead selection and wondering but but yeah, yeah, there's some amazing artists out there that are doing such cool work, just like experimenting, using pastels. And like, I'm kind of seeing though too, like um, even just with the contemporary beads, they're making like old colors come back. Yes. It's really hard to find the old 
old, I mean, I mean, literally they're dead stock, right? They're dead stock. Yeah. They're no longer available. You know, once they're gone, they're gone. But it's really cool to see that we're getting some sources of beads that are using old types of colors and like the greasies, the oilies and totally i love that as well it's very yeah it's you know and i when i started beading i was like i didn't know a delica from a seed bead from like i had no idea you know and then i was like this whole new world of bead sizes and colors and different you know and i tend to like i'll do like a big vintage bead order well big i mean can't get tons of at a time sometimes but and then i'll stick within that new order like my whole collection will be based on like these new colors and then the next collection will be like blending the new colors with the old colors or whatever it is. But I, I always find like when I get new ones, I'm so excited that they like that collection revolves around those new colors. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that's one tid tidbit to share with the audience is that you get limited, uh, limit uh, arrangement or limited selection of based on your bead colors. Yeah, yeah. And it's like whatever you can find. And I mean, it. I think it gets challenging. I'm sure you like experience this as well, but you start to kind of step up your game with your colors or your, your, your get, you get better at finding those dead stock beads, but then it's like, now I need a space to be able to look at them all together <laughs> to choose colors, you know? And so it just gets like, to be like, how do I store these and look at them? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I totally feel that for sure. It's, uh, <laughs> there's no, there's no such thing as, you know, you don't have enough, not enough beads. No such thing. <laughs> no such thing at all. <laughs> so I want to get back to, um, I really, really, um, you mentioned about, you know, drawing inspiration from some of the old designs that runs in your family, um, which I think is really important part of that storytelling, you know. Um, uh, so what are some of these Flora designs that you've kind of explored and like it kind of you know, made you think about different differently, not just with the design, but, you know, possibly the plant itself or the flower or even, you know, in your home territory. Yeah, I think probably the biggest, the biggest one that comes to mind for me is the trilliums. Um, when you drive into my home community, it's, um, there's a lot of sort of deciduous forest all around it and it's just carpeted in trilliums in the springtime and it is it just it, there's just something about it for me that is so visceral and that it just like it instantly transports me back there and brings me home and um that's probably one of the first it wasn't even like a I mean, you see so much, you see so many trilliums, like if you look at Christy Belcourt's work or, or anybody, you know, they're, they're all bringing trilliums sort of into it because they are such a woodland flower. And, and um, that's probably the first one that really, it, it wasn't necessarily something that was like, you know, unique to my family by any means, but it, you saw it in our art and you saw it sort of consistently for a very long time. And so it was kind of that piece, I think for me is just like home like the, those florals for me. And, and, you know, you, yeah, it gives you a, a different relationship to those plants and to like when you are in the bush and you're interacting with those plants and just like, I feel like you get like a very spiritual connection to them when you, when you are beating them and they are coming like into your life so much. And, you know, I think, I do, I have, you know, like some of, some of these newer pieces I'm doing are probably more of the pieces that I've ever done that are reflective of really old um, work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that some of it is like, and I don't know if this happens for you, Elaine, and people like it, sometimes I feel strange saying it because it's hard to explain, but I, a lot of my patterns or colors come to me almost in dreams. Oh, no. So it's, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's not even like I'm fully asleep though. Like I'm very aware, but it'll come every once in a while. Like I'll just get, it's like, it'll, they'll come into my brain and I can't stop. Like I'll, I, and I've gotten used to just getting up now and getting a sketch, sketch pad and I'll just draw for like a couple of hours. And it's always in the middle of the night. It's always when it's like dead quiet and I'm by myself. And then I don't always create everything from those, but that's where a lot of it comes from. And 
Um, mm -hmm. I feel like that is such a, a powerful tie to our ancestors when that happens. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think we talk a lot about how, you know, we've had so many things in our, in our communities and in our history that have tried to break some of those ties. And I feel like on a very spiritual level, that's the way that we maintain those. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's really powerful what you just shared, because I think that for some of us, you know, these sparks of inspiration just comes out of nowhere. And they're drawn from these sources. And uh, I mentioned earlier, like, you know, sometimes on a moment's notice, I'll just have, you know, an inspiration just to make something just because I feel like, you know, it's there. It's sometimes it doesn't last very long. So I'm going to act on it now. And, <laughs> but yeah, totally. It's like, um, you know, it's a, it's a powerful process, you know, making draws from many different places. Like we've seen before from our community, our family, our culture, our land, you know, and it comes at various times and, um, you know, and, and, it points me to to ask as well, like, you know, some of our making processes is very seasonal. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, we do more beading in the winter, we do more high tanning, you know, when in the fall or spring, at least for me, that's, that's, that's the schedule I run on. But, uh, but what has been making like for you in terms of a schedule? And like, how are you? How are you able to do that today? um where you are yeah you're totally right about the seasons like in the summer I'm outside more I'm on the land more um and just sort of almost like filling back up for like a winter season of sort of like hibernating and creating but I'm very much a night a nighttime person so I like as terms of hours of the day like I usually wake up a bit later and I spend time outside I go for a hike I you know exercise and just sort of get my like computer admin stuff done during the day and then kind of right around the evening time that's like when it's calm and like inspiration sort of strikes for me is and I'll be till sometimes till two or three in the morning because I like that it's it just feels quiet to me and everyone's asleep and I just can you can put you can put that focus and that energy and that channeling all into your work and so for me that's that's when I create but it does it does ca cause a mess, like if I have to be up early or something, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> sometimes though, time does stand still. Like sometimes when I'm making, I'm in the zone, in the creative zone and like, yeah, you know, hours go by and I wouldn't even notice. I'm like, already? Like, I don't want to stop now. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a very, I think the, the making period, um, for me, it's just, it's so important, you know, it's so nourishing. It's so, it replenished, you know, a part of us. And, um, you know, I think it just, it's, that is really informed by, you know, our worldview and our practice and the things that informs that worldview. Um, and that's why for me, um, in my work, you know, I draw on so much, not just with the, the work that I do directly with my family and in my home territory, but it's also like a continuation of when I'm not at home, you know, that's why I draw on museums, museum collections um, and looking at those and looking at the stories. And it's just, I've gathered so much amazing information and learning about, you know, Gwich'in uh, beating history um, from particular people that has been so influential at the height of this beadwork tradition in the last hundred years. So it's so amazing. Like, it's just, it's so powerful. And I think that we're really lucky that we can be able to continue this art form um, in the places we come from. I agree. You know, I think for me, like uh, my dad has been this really interesting, It's it's been such an interesting thing for our relationship for me to sort of become an artist and and because he grew up with you know he was raised by his granny and and she was an artist and it's like it was so funny the one day he like I was I was I had gotten a roadkill porcupine and I was trying to dequill I was trying to like teach myself how to dequill this thing in the backyard and my dad shows up and it was like out of nowhere he was just like oh he's like what are you doing this is what you do and he like all of a sudden 
had like all of this knowledge that I didn't even know he had. And he was like, you can't do that. And like, he's like, don't boil it in the house or move it out here. Like he was just, he like sprung into action, you know, and it's been, it's very similar. Like, again, like when you're ready for those teachings, you get them. I'm sure as a child, my dad was like, look at these cool books I have, or look at this. And I was just like, okay, dad. And, you know, but he came over the other day with those books. It was maybe about three months ago. And I was like, they have all of our like really cool old pictures of bead work and they have different methods of dying naturally. And I was like, dad, like what, <laughs> you know, like, but he, he's just been this, it's been really cool. Like he has so much knowledge that he's almost not forgotten, but suppressed in different ways. And now it's like he, we just spend so much time together. We're actually taking a language course together, um, which has been just the coolest. And and so, uh, and it, again, it's very similar. Like I, I had no idea how much language he did know and spoke. And, and so he's really pushing me to learn and he's talking to me in it. And he's like having so much fun with it and old songs. And like, it's just been so powerful and so healing but he's been this amazing untapped resource to teach me. Wow. So much That's amazing. Great. And I mean, you sharing about your project that you're doing with your father, like that sounds so incredible. And I really look forward to seeing it, you know, when it's available for you to share with us. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a very powerful combination of things coming together for you and for your father. That's really incredible. Um, one of the things I'd like to... Um, is, uh, you know, I, I mentioned, like, I'm a huge fan of your work. You've been everywhere. I've seen you participate in art festivals, like in the Yukon. You know, you participated in places like Indigenous Fashion Week in Toronto, and you've done such amazing collaborations with other Indigenous artists, such as, you know, recently, you know, this recent collab with Métis Gwich'in artist Naomi Burke in your release of your amazing beaded uh, earrings and muskox horn. So what's next for White Otter Designs? Um, where is your art going to take you next? I guess like we'll see. <laughs> um, I Part of it is I, I really would like to do some fashion, but not like a lot of fast fashion type thing, but um, more of just like really like expressive sort of pieces that have like lived in my brain for a really long time but I you know something I've learned through the process is that I don't have to I don't have to do everything all the time and I think you know in our I think historically too in our communities like people all had a role in things and I think that for me I've really learned you know like um you know, whether it's collaborating with my dad or collaborating with another artist, like, you know, Naomi, like she's so fun. I'm not a silversmith and, and she is, and she, I've, I love her as an artist. And so being able to bring those different elements and different teachings and different cultures all together into different pieces, like, I think they're just so powerful and it, like, mm -hmm. um, finding our commonalities, but also still expressing ourselves differently. I think that there's beauty in that. And so, um, yeah, I think for me, like I, I, you know, I'm just going to continue to explore that and continue to, you know, I, I think I, I want to continue definitely learning my language because I think that really strengthens my artistic practice and um, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's amazing. Um, I want to share with everyone um, that here at the Royal Opera Museum, we are very lucky to actually have uh, a set of one of your bead, beaded earrings. If it's possible um, for one of our tech folks, if we could be able to show uh, to the audience members, you know, photos of uh, um, Jamie's incredible earrings that uh, we have in our collection. And it's based on beadwork traditions uh, that informs uh, from your Anishinaabe culture. Um, can we be able to have that up on the screen? It's so cool on the display too. I'm very honored that our pieces are side by side. <laughs> I absolutely adore your work as well. So that is really, that is very, very cool, I think. <laughs> so 
so yeah, so these are all the the beautiful arrangement, the different types of beads. Do you want to just explain to folks like uh, this particular set and like the motifs and what you used and it's so beautiful. Yeah, so these are my uh, debajmo and florals, which actually means storytelling. Um, and I was actually getting my headshots done with Tenille Campbell of Sweet Womb. And she was like, I love them because they tell a story. And that's where the name came from. But these are probably um, some of the more like uh, personal, I guess, designs that I do because they're they're really like, I, I feel like they kind of bring together like, you know, I love florals obviously and floral beadwork. And so this, it's such a cool way for me to be able to do a, a variety of different florals is what I really enjoy about them. But um, yeah, so these have, these are all vintage beads except the gold beads, but they're, they're all different sizes. They're all different sort of like textures and finishes. Um, there is some metal beads in there as well, uh, which I have that are pretty rare. And there's a uh, freshwater pearl in there. Um, but yeah, this the, this piece, these ones were some of like, probably some of my favorites of these, this particular style. And they're a little bit larger than what I normally uh, would do. But I, I just, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure like, they're very much, I would say like probably the most, expressive or indicative of who I am as a person and an artist is this mm -hmm. stuff. So it's a real honor to create these for for this display for the museum. Amazing. Well we are very lucky that we've had this as a contribution of your work and it's actually part of um, a new case that we have here at the in the main uh, gallery hall here at the Royal Upper Museum. Um, and shortly I'll get Emma to introduce that. Um, but my, I guess my last question that I just like to, to ask you, I mean, um, it has been such a pleasure having you and having you share your story and to share your process for making. So who, are, who is your favorite indigenous artist that you'd like to give a shout out to? Oh no, oh my gosh. Do you know who actually I wanna shout out? Um, I mean, we all know like Jamie Okuma like was such a huge inspiration. She's so phenomenal, um, huge inspiration for me starting out. But I, I think, you know, who's really been incredible to me lately is uh, she's an Anishinaabe artist from Thunder Bay. Her name is Cher Chapman. Um, and she has been doing like size 15s, but like her work is, um, it's just like so unique and something I haven't seen before. And she's kind of just like really stepped out into like the social media world, I guess. I'm sure she's been creating for a while, but, uh, yeah. And I know she's very close to Jean Marshall, who I also think is an oh. um, artist and her color. So yeah, I think uh, there's some really, really cool work coming out of the Thunder Bay area at the moment. And uh, but yeah, share share Chapman lately, like all of her earring drops, I'm like on it. So <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, there you go, audience. You have some uh, names dropped, so you can actually <laughs> check out these incredible artists as well. Um, yeah, I'm a huge fan as well of them both. And yeah, when we're talking earlier about bees and bee colors, you know, the first person that came to mind was Jean. And yeah, yeah. Cool work. So you guys have to check that out. Um, Definitely. And for me, there's so, so many. I know like I, that question came out of nowhere. It's so hard <laughs> to choose. There's so much incredible Indigenous artists out there. And mm -hmm. I am just so incredible lucky that, you know, we're, we're, I'm part of that or we're part of that together with them. Yeah. And I like to just give a highlight to my absolute favorite Dakota artist, Holly Young. Uh, oh, yes. Holly is amazing. Uh, Métis bead worker Lisa Shepard. Um, I love her work. That's just incredible. I've seen it firsthand, up close. Beautiful work. Heather Dixon, Dixon Designs. Uh, yeah. Incredible artist right now to watch, folks. Please mm. follow her. And two more, Elias Not Afraid and Helen Trennell with Trennell Originals. Those are the ones yeah. that I really love to, to see. They're so artistic, just, you know, so much inspiration. And I'm really, yeah, I feel quite honored to be 
to to watch them too to watch them grow and as well as you <laughs> yeah oh and the feeling is absolutely multi, like mutual I feel so honored to own some of your work and and you can feel like you know the love and the tradition and the teachings you put into those and I I love it like they're so special to me so um yeah, I, I think that the community is just so we could go all day about other like amazing artists who've inspired me along the way and yourself sure like I'm sure as well but yeah I love everyone on that list too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, um, just doing a time check here uh, we're getting close to the hour, um, we had to uh, start a little bit later, uh, but uh, I would like to just check in with. Um, uh, with uh, Emma again, uh, because we do have a sneak peek for our audience members about what is in the gallery and what to expect. And yeah, uh, last words, I'd like to say thank you for everyone for joining us this evening. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Jamie, for sharing your wonderful story. Thank you so, thank you much, so much, everybody, uh, Frams and, and uh, the Royal Alberta Museum and uh, Emma and Elaine uh, specifically, but uh, that was just so wonderful and enjoyable and uh, just chimiwetch to all of you too for being here. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jamie and Elaine. That was like the best and fastest hour. <laughs> of my life um it was really great to hear your journeys and to just like listen to you talk about your experiences and your teachings and your work and it was really beautiful really inspiring um and jamie next time you're in town please come by and visit because we have a really beautiful and old bead collection that i'm sure that you would love <laughs> i can't wait yeah. <laughs> um so yeah, uh, I was really lucky this year uh, to work on the In Their Footsteps case, which both Jamie and Elaine's work is included in. Um, it was originally installed in 2018, but it came up as um, a case that we needed to redevelop because some of the pieces in there were um, light sensitive, and so we needed to uh, kind of refresh the case. Um, over the past couple of years in Indigenous studies, we've really been focusing on collecting and acquiring work directly from Indigenous artists and designers. So we had a really great selection of um, pieces to choose from. So I worked with the nine different artists and designers that are featured in the case, including Elaine and Jamie, but also Mobilize, Section 35, Albertine Crochu of Full Plume Studio, Lux Ready to Wear, Preneska Designs, Heather Crochu Couture and the Chief's Daughter. And there'll be some other events coming up this year with all of those artists as well. So make sure you check them out too. Um, I'm just gonna play a, a little clip we have of um, the case. So it's kind of a sneak peek and uh, hopefully this works. But let me pull it up here. Okay, so you guys are the first people to see this case. <laughs> um, we did open to the public today, so please come down and visit and you can see Elaine and Jamie's work in, in real life, um, which is kind of a nice thing to be able to do right now after COVID. So um, yeah, I welcome you all to come down and visit. And uh, before we wrap up, I'd just like to mention that we do have another online Zoom event happening on June 28th. 
week at 3 p.m. Uh, it's called Resurgent Practices in Beadwork Traditions and High Tanning with Jessica Sanderson Berry. Jessica is the artist behind J Shine Designs, and you can check out her work on um, her Instagram page, which is J Shine Designs. So please join us for this event. You can register for this talk on our website on the Indigenous History Month page, where you found the link for this event today. So a huge thank you, Jamie and Elaine, for uh, this amazing event this evening. It was really awesome to, to spend this time with you. And um, thank you, everybody, for coming today. And thank you to Frams for hosting this event. And I hope everybody has a good evening. Okay, bye.